Greetings everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If you are new here, or you've been sitting in the shadows, and you enjoy what you are hearing, please consider showing some love to that subscribe button and its friend, the notification bell. And make sure you have that one set to all, that way you'll be reminded of every time I upload a video, which tends to be daily. If you'd like to learn how to become a member of the channel or would like to buy me a coffee as a special thank you, those links can be found down below. With all of that being said, it is time to go back to ashes, for once we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Scary Stories. Since this is a compilation video, I have taken all the genres I normally narrate and just piled them into one video in no particular order. Also, if you happen to hear a bell in the background, I'll try to edit it out as much as possible, but it's just Stormy saying hello, my one-year-old kitten. <laughs> Right after this intro, an ad will play. I'll read the first story, an ad will play. I'll read the second story, an ad will play. And there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes. This happened maybe six years ago now. I had just graduated college and was working at a little ad agency in my city. I was living in a cramped one-bedroom apartment with my unemployed girlfriend and my cat. I was in a little six-story building with maybe 20 apartments total, just off of a main street. There was no security guard at the entrance of the building, but an automatically locking door that required a key code to enter was. The fourth floor was home to a few students and couples, and my apartment was right next to a vacant studio, making it pretty quiet most of the time. After a long night in the office the night before, I didn't feel up to going into work, so I called out and turned my alarm off. I cuddled up to my girlfriend in hopes of sleeping till noon. At around 10 a.m., pounding on my front door that woke both of us up, and so I went to go check it out. Just a minute, I yelled, as I threw on a shirt and sweatpants, expecting a surprise visit from the maintenance man or something. In a groggy state, I couldn't really tell that anything was off, but I peeked through the peephole and didn't see anyone. Opening the door felt different somehow, and I immediately noticed a large depression in the wall, two or three feet from my door. Looking down, I could see shards of wood that had broken free from the casing around the door, and I noticed the wood beginning to separate at the hinges. The hair on the back of my neck raised as I pieced the scene together. Someone had been trying to kick my door down and was pressing themselves against the wall for support. It scared us both for a while, and we slid a couch in front of the door before bed each night for a few months after that. I'm not sure what their intentions were that day, and we moved soon after that, but I could never stop questioning what would have happened had they heard my girlfriend's voice instead of mine. This happened several years ago, over five years, but not quite ten years ago. I have numerous health conditions, so at the time I was a homemaker and my husband worked during the day. I was taking a daytime nap one day, always keeping my bedroom door shut and locked while sleeping when my husband was at work. I had four dogs at the time, all chihuahuas that slept with me. I was sleeping peacefully for a few hours until suddenly I heard a very loud and almost aggressive pounding on my bedroom door. Although this was unlike my husband to do, I looked at the clock thinking maybe I was sleeping so heavily he had gotten home from work and was trying to get my attention to open the locked bedroom door. 
When I looked at the clock, he wasn't due to be home for a few more hours, and my husband would have been saying my name repeatedly to get my attention also. I was startled by the pounding, as it was very loud, and as previously mentioned, seeming almost aggressive in nature. I immediately jumped out of bed and stared at the door, not knowing what to do at first, since I thought someone had broken into my house. Then, what happened next was so extremely bizarre that even I can't keep from laughing when I tell the story to others present day because it wasn't so funny at the time. As bizarre as this may sound, the remote control from our living room was then seen being shoved under the crack of our door in between the carpet and the bottom of the door. Keep in mind, I was just abruptly woken up, so I thought, could I be imagining this? But this was not to be considering, not one, not two, not three, but all four of my dogs were not only barking hysterically at the pounding itself, but they were on the bed staring down at the exact part of the floor where the remote was being shoved under it, with the hairs on their backs standing straight on end. I grabbed my phone and immediately dialed 911, thinking someone had broken in, and quietly told them what was going on. The dispatcher had me stay on the line with her until police arrived to the house. She informed me that I would see police walking around my house, but not to worry. It was the police scoping out the perimeter. She then tells me that they cannot find any signs of forced entry or suspicious activity. So go ahead and go to the front door, where the police were there to assist me further. Upon leaving my room, not only was there no one in sight, but the remote control all four of my dogs and I had just seen being shoved under the door was on the coffee table in the living room, right where I had left it. I get to the front door where at least half a dozen police officers are surrounding my house with SWAT-style rifles complete with their canine units. They offered to walk through the house. Once again, they said there were no signs of forced entry or suspicious activity, nothing that would lead them to think that anyone was over there. I have no idea what would have transpired had my bedroom door been unlocked, and I'm not so sure I'd even want to know. To this day, I still have no idea who or what it was, or what it had against remote controls. To my knowledge, Nothing else like this has ever happened since then. After a five-year relationship ended in 2005, my ex began stalking me. Everywhere I was, he would somehow also be. He started calling my family and others. It was relentless and grew more intense with the passing of time. I became convinced that he was never going to move on. I sought and granted a lifetime restraining order. After hearing testimony from both sides, the judge didn't appear to have any trouble making that decision. Fast forward to 2019, and this man is still focused on me as has been made apparent by various occurrences which serve to tell me so, the physical artifacts of, and witnesses to which I still have in my possession. The list grows longer with every passing year. I have had to learn to live with the knowledge that I am likely being watched on social media by this man, and that because of this, he very likely could be positioning himself to watch me in my daily life. Most of the time, his actions are more covert, but sometimes they're quite overt. A few years ago, he found reason to openly contact my adult daughter. I know what it feels like to be stalked. I also know the various factors which make up the legal definition of stalking. As a result, if I am ever asked, Pointedly, to leave someone alone, not message them ever again, etc. I take those requests seriously. From that very instant, 
I cease communication. As difficult and as heart-rending as it might be, I will not contact them again. Not in a billion years. Moving on can be a terrible, terrible task. When things end suddenly, it can be extremely difficult to wrap one's mind around what has just happened. These types of endings also jumpstart the long period of contemplation inherent to any learning experience, and it's not any fun. I've been there, and I'm well acquainted with longing, sadness, and remorse. Good memories will never fade. My words to my loved ones remain sincere after a relationship ends, especially when written in kindness and admiration. For me, forgiveness is automatic and easy, no matter the heart of the other party. I forgive them whether they wish me happiness or continued suffering, whether they accept my apology or whether, after receiving it, they only laugh out loud more loudly. With people, my actions are not always perfect, but my motives are always pure. I never set out to do harm. As such, when a relationship must come to an end, I maintain only the best of wishes for my friend, and I will forever honor a request for peace. I spent part of my life living in a house that was haunted, or maybe cursed, I don't know. There's a lot of backstory and several very significant ghost stories. I've never shared those with anyone before and rarely tell them in real life, like almost never. I think they sound crazy. But yesterday and today I was forced to go back to this house to deal with the situation where my relative had barricaded himself inside with a knife, a sickle with a handle wrapped in duct tape, and was refusing to allow his mother into the home. All I could think, as he told me his delusions of witches and curses, was how much I felt like I understood what he was talking about. He was misplacing this onto his mom. But him feeling cursed and affected by an evil presence, I completely related to. I left there today after he safely left the home, feeling paranoid and agitated, like people were looking at him and knew something was wrong. I felt like everyone at the grocery store was talking about me when I heard the conversation around me. I feel somewhat better now, but I suspect there will be vivid nightmares and night terrors. To give you the shortest backstory, the house was previously owned by a very nice family that happened to belong to a cult of Christian mystics who believe in communicating with the dead. They really were a nice family otherwise. The following is a short story from my time in that house. One summer, in the middle of the day, the feeling in the house began to change. My mom was outside gardening, and I certainly didn't want to go tell her. I was scared of the house in the middle of the day. She had enough on her plate. My grandfather once told me that electricity keeps ghosts away, so I began walking around the house turning on every light we had. The air began to feel heavier and everything looked a little different, darker, maybe blurring slightly, like looking through a light fog. As I walked through the dining room archway into the living room, I saw, standing on the bare hardwood floors, a black mass, maybe three feet high, the size of a big dog, looking at me. It didn't have a clear face, but I knew it was looking at me. If I had to say what it was shaped like, I would say a big cat or some kind of animal, but black as tar and not transparent. It appeared to be a physical body thing. No texture, just black corporeal shadow. I turned and ran as hard as I could out of the house. I clipped the door frame as I left the house, spun around, and fell off the porch onto the grass. Then I stood up made sure I was safe, and went to watch my mom garden after a few minutes of recovery. I did not tell her what I saw. 
I was well aware that we could not afford to move anyway, and I felt I would be putting myself at risk, telling a story that sounded this crazy. Risk of what I don't know. If you have listened to my story, thank you. I hope none of you have to experience what I went through. My junior year of high school, my parents got a job offer out of state, and so I was forced to move all across the country. I started at a new school late into the academic year, mid-March, and had a hard time fitting into the new school. All I wanted was to make a friend, but was too shy to talk to anyone. It was around this time that my friends left MySpace to join Facebook. So, I did the same to keep close to them. Some days later, I received a friend request from David. David was a guy that I had been friends with in my old town. Well, he wasn't exactly my friend, but rather the friend of another friend. My friend Jerry had introduced him to the group and would bring him along every time all of us hung out. We knew that David was a year older than us and that he had gone to a different school, but rather than that, we didn't really know anything about him. In fact, we kind of always just referred to him as Jerry's friend because he never even bothered to talk to any of us. When I received a friend request from him on Facebook, I was more than confused. He had hardly spoken to me when I had lived near him. So for him to want to be friends with me after all of this time just seemed a little strange. But I was lonely and desperate for friends that I didn't care. Other than that, nothing seemed off about him. At least not at the time. Looking back, I do remember that we hardly had any pictures or friends when I first accepted his request. But like I said... This was around the time that people had just started using Facebook, so it didn't seem all that weird for him to have such a barren profile. And over the years, his friend list got a lot bigger, even more so than mine, so I didn't really think anything of it. But anyway, I digress. I accepted his friend request, and it was just like this that David and I became friends. He told me that he just started university and that he was lonely because he was too shy to make friends. I told him that I was having a hard time in my new school for the same reasons, and we bonded over that. Little by little, we started talking more. He shared his problems with me, and I shared mine with him. And when it was time for me to apply to university, he even helped me out. He taught me how to sign up for my SATs and ACTs, helped me apply to scholarships, and even paid for one of the application fees. Using a Visa gift card, so I didn't receive any of his personal information, and he didn't receive any of mine. Then, when I finally started university, he helped me with that as well. He told me where to buy books, gave me studying tips, provided emotional support. So... When he asked for my phone number, I didn't even hesitate to give it to him. David was my best friend, and I wanted to keep him close, even if we were physically away from each other. It was around this time that David started sharing more of his life with me, and all of it was pretty normal stuff. He had a job at Pizza Hut, which he hated but needed to keep in order to pay for bills. He also played soccer, and not for his university or anything. It was just a group of guys that got together on the weekends to unwind. I think the biggest thing he told me was that he had flunked out of university, and that I was the only one that knew because he was too embarrassed to tell anyone else. And at one point, he also had to move back in with his mom, which he hated a lot. I kept insisting and asking for a reason, and then he finally gave me one. He told me that his pictures had been heavily edited and that he was afraid of disappointing me if we met in real life. I told him that it didn't matter what he looked like and that I just wanted to meet him, 
but he still didn't want to hang out. Instead, he just started being a huge dick to me. He knew exactly what buttons to push, knew all of my insecurities and secrets, and had started using all of that knowledge to hurt me. So I stopped talking to him. Some weeks later, I meet my friends as planned, and much to my surprise, I see David there, looking just like he did in his pictures. I didn't understand why he had lied about photoshopping his pictures or why he had said he didn't want to meet me only for him to show up at our friend's house. But I was so angry at him that I didn't ask any questions. I just kept waiting for an apology, but David wouldn't approach me. He was treating me like he treated me back when we were in high school. I was really upset. But given that he had been such a huge dick to me, I just figured that this was just another attempt at getting under my skin. We were all drinking and talking about what we were up to, and when it was his time to share, he pretty much just said the same things that I had already known about him. He said that he wished that he was still in university like the rest of us, but that he had flunked out and that he was just living with his mom, said that he was miserable there and that he wanted to move out, but his job at Pizza Hut wasn't paying enough for him to move out on his own. At this point, though, I was already pretty pissed off, and the alcohol had given me just enough liquid courage to finally ask him why he had been ignoring me. He apologized, but admitted that he hardly remembered me, which hurt my feelings, but also pissed me off even more. I told him about Facebook and about our text messages, and he just kept insisting that he didn't use Facebook. Apparently, he had used MySpace at one point, but it stopped using that when he had switched over to Tumblr. A Facebook account was something that he didn't even consider making. I asked him about the text messages, and he just said that I had probably confused him with another David because he had never had my number. I thought that denying it was a lousy excuse, but Jerry backed him up, which pissed me off even more. The thing, though, was that David hadn't just been talking to me on Facebook, but also to a bunch of us. So when we kept calling him out on his shit, he just told us to text this David guy to prove that it wasn't him. He set his phone on the table and I texted him, but no new messages appeared on his phone. Then, while we're all arguing about how we need to give it some time, the David that I had been talking to for years responds, proving that we had been talking to a fake all along. Things turned pretty awkward at this point, with all of us feeling angry and betrayed, and David obviously feeling extremely violated. So, with all of us wanting answers, we opened up our friend's laptop and searched for David's profile on Facebook. The first thing that David points out is that whoever this was, they were using his mother's maiden name and not his real last name. And that's while most of the people on his friends list were people that he knew in real life. None of them were people that he had kept in contact with. His display picture was also of a dog, which he had owned several years ago, but that had since died, just like the fake David had told me. All measures that, looking back, I'm guessing were used by this person to keep David's close friends from actually finding him on Facebook. The older pictures on Facebook had been taken from his MySpace back when he had still been using that. But most of the newer ones had been taken from his Tumblr, which he apparently uploaded pretty often. The weirdest thing, though, was there were some pictures he swore he had never seen before. These were all pictures of his soccer games taken from the audience, which the fake David had said his brother had taken. The real David said his brother never went to his games. Neither did any of his family members or friends. Further exploring his own fake account, David pointed out that while a bunch of status updates were of things that had never happened, a lot of them were accurate. Whoever this person was, 
They had been watching David for a long time. They knew his schedule, knew what movies he went to, knew what ice cream flavors he liked, knew his favorite bands, knew practically everything about him. We did confront the fake David, but he never answered the text messages and instead deleted the profile before we had the chance to examine it any further. So we never did get any answers. I don't know why that person pretended to be David for so long or why they even did it in the first place. All I know was that I felt extremely violated for having shared so many private details of my life with them. And of course, I also felt a great deal of pity for the real David. I wondered for the longest time how this person found him and how they managed to learn so many private details of his life. Then, a few months back, my mother calls me saying that she found a profile with her name, but my pictures were on it. My middle name is my mom's first name, something that very few people know. She thought that I had made a second profile, and I didn't tell her the truth, because I didn't want to scare her, but truth was that I didn't even know that profile existed. I have always kept Facebook set to private, and I no longer accept random friend requests, nor do I post my pictures anywhere else. So this profile only had really old pictures of me, and nothing weird like David's soccer game pictures. But it was still active, and had been active for a while. None of the friends were people that I know, and none of the updates were of things that I've been doing in real life. So, I don't know if the profile belonged to the same person that stalked David, but I'm extremely average looking, so I don't know why anyone would want to use my pictures when there are way prettier girls online. So, I'm guessing it had to be him. I don't know. I just reported the profile, and it no longer exists. But I wonder if this person is still pretending to be me, or if they've moved on to someone else. It's been a long while since I've written anything related to the Disney Corporation, and I'm sure you can understand why. A lot has been going on since I posted the first part of this story. I've received a lot of questions and concerns from folks who read my first-hand account of Mowgli's Palace, a resort that was built and abandoned by Disney. I want to thank everyone who mirrored my post. It's been taken down from a few places mostly corporate sites that were easily leaned on by a larger power. However, for every nuked topic or disappearing blog post, it seems like a hundred more have popped up. This is something that they'll have to face. There's no turning back for them, none for me either. I'm definitely being followed. For the first month or two, I chalked it up to paranoia. Any casual glance or half-smile in my direction set me off, hairs standing on the back of my neck and everything. The first one, or rather the first one I was actually able to spot, was a telephone worker milling around my apartment complex. He was middle-aged, doughy, dressed just as you'd expect, but something just seemed off about him. I couldn't place it, but... I know this wasn't just my imagination acting up. He was awkward and out of place, not somebody who was comfortable doing his routine job. I followed him around a corner, only to lose him there. When I turned back to go home, there he was, staring directly at me, about ten feet behind me, expressionless and cold. Exploring, are we? He asked. That was all he said, and there was an accusing tone to his voice. Tell me, what blue-collar bone jockey does that sort of thing? I guess that's the worst part, never feeling safe. Never feeling alone. That and the occasional Disney merchandise left somewhere for me to find. Little rubber Mickeys in the mailbox, a Disney Adventures magazine on my bookshelf. 
They hide little Mickeys everywhere. Three circles, one big, two small, in the silhouette of the famous mouse's head. I've started keeping a running list of Mickeys I've found. Coffee mug rings on my coffee table, one big, two small. Colored glass bottles left on the doorstep, viewed from the top down, all red. Graffiti on the wall on my way to work, a huge earth, small sun, and moon in the proper locations. They are everywhere. People have emailed me about this as well. If you repost anything, I have to say, you're going to start finding those son-of-a-bitch outlines. I guarantee it. The best one by far, one that actually made me laugh because of the horror of it all, was a drawing in chalk next to my car. I was taken aback at first, walking through the parking garage, keeping an eye out for people following me. The outline seemed a perfect match for, well, a murder victim, written in yellow, paint, I'm sure, with a single word, retract. The only good thing that has come out of all of this is that I know I am not the only one who's seen something they shouldn't have. I'm not going to give their names because, well, if I have to tell you why, you haven't been paying attention. Researcher goes to Disney parks whenever he can. All throughout the year, he's not going to have fun, enjoy the rides, etc. He's looking for the gas cot. There's been a long tradition, apparently, of people reporting strange patrons throughout the park. Silent, motionless, staring patrons of every age, shape, and size. Men and women, adults, children, and teenagers, all wearing Disney-themed gas masks. Way back when, Disney would get tons of complaints about oddly dressed folks following others around the park. Folks who would then merge into crowds and disappear. Later on, the gas masks caused folks to draw other conclusions, and reports of possible terrorists and bombers started flowing. All of those reports most likely went straight into the trash can. I know I can't find any sign of any such occasions reported on by the media. Although you should be aware of the fact Disney can pretty much control its press like no other. Researcher goes to the parks, talks to a few people, and tries not to draw any attention to himself. He'll just ask three or four families if they've seen his friend, who wears a funny mask. He has yet to see the gas cot for himself, though on one occasion, a child pointed him toward Frontier Town. As he raced through the crowd, he heard a single voice ahead cry out, Mommy, I want a goofy air mask too. A fellow I'll call lifeguard worked in a Disney water park from 2001 through 2003. He stood at the top of a huge water slide and made sure none of the kids got too rowdy. He passed the kids though, one at a time, telling them over and over again to be safe keeping their arms in, and so on. One day, as he tells it, this fat kid goes down the tube, doesn't come out on the other end. He sent two or three kids after. The whole thing moves at a steady clip, so naturally you'd expect that if that fat kid got stuck, the kids that followed him were stuck too. Not so. Only the big kid disappears. Everyone else comes out at the other end, cheering and splashing like nothing's wrong. Lifeguard shuts down the slide, much to the aggravation of the kids waiting. Before he can go through any of the Disney's strict procedures, splash, the fat kid finally comes out. Staff members pull the kid out of the water. He sank like a stone when he hit, his skin already blue and his eyes wide. All he could say was, no face kids, and stop squeezing. The kid was okay, in case you're wondering. He got carted off right to the medical center. When lifeguard was told to open the slide back up, 
He made a big stink about it, clearly not being safe. Despite his complaints, he was threatened with firing and begrudgingly opened the slide again. From that point on, he kept a closer eye on the kids. Every so often, they'd come out in the wrong order. Never as stunned as the fat kid, but always with a vague look of concern, a dreamy half-stupor that seemed as if they were trying to figure out what was reality. They'd take on some water and choke a bit, and they'd never come back up to ride again. I read his emails with the same sort of unease you might be feeling right now. I wanted him to share his story, but in the end, he didn't want to expose himself that way. I can't say I blame him. Snow White, which wasn't the actual role she played, was a character in the park. She had a nice little tidbit for me. You know, what happens when a costumed employee drops dead in a suit? Like, one second he's taking a picture with little Jimmy, and the next, he's had a fatal stroke? A second costumed mascot in the area has to sit with the corpse on a curb or bench and wait for a designated dry cleaner to arrive and cart the body away in a discreet manner. All the while, patrons have no idea they're sitting with a dead body for photo ops. Feel free to check your photo albums at this point. That was bad, but another fellow janitor went completely off the creepy charts. Disney World, and probably others, is built with a series of underground tunnels just below your feet. Bet you didn't know that one. Three stories worth. Anything and everything you can imagine is down there for use of the employees. They're called Utilidors. Utility Corridors, but put together. Basically, that's the reason you don't see characters out of place or janitors wandering around the park. They pop in and out of hidden doors and travel a concealed tunnel you're walking on. Janitor told me something that might be common knowledge, but was nonetheless news to me. Walt Disney had several apartments built into his parks. There's one above Cinderella's Castle. There's one in the Pirates of the Caribbean ride. They're all over the place. More than that, there are nightclubs, a movie theater, a bowling alley, and much more. All behind doors built right into the whimsical facades you've passed by without a second look. Club 22 is one such hidden area. If you have the cash to join the exclusive club, you don't then you'll have access to it, and much more. Club 22 is a place where anything goes. Disney Company calls those places dark zones, spots where the squeaky clean visage of Mickey Mouse gives way to drinking, drugs, and yeah, sex. Conversely, the rest of the park is the bright zone, with a few gray zone utilidors between. As far as Janitor has said, it wasn't always that way. It was more of a slow decline and the gradual relaxation of social norms within that elite group. The reason he knows all of this? You may have already guessed. He's cleaned it. After a lengthy background check and a non-disclosure form, Janitor moved up from a park attendant to one of the Dark Zone cleaning crew. Now, before you get some satanic human sacrifice vision in your head, Janitor saw nothing of the sort. Lots of empty alcohol bottles? Yes. Used condoms scattered like deflated New Year's E balloons? Oh yeah. He cleaned up his share of blood, piss, and vomit, but it was all down to the unrestricted behavior of patrons as opposed to any sort of cult behavior. At least that's how he sees it, in retrospect. All that trash, that profane shit, went into a furnace and mingled with the smoke of a quaint cottage's chimney. If you've been to Disney World, you've breathed ultra-condensed sin. Backing up this information was Hammer. Hammer mailed me the old-fashioned way, though I don't know how he got my home address. 
He sent me photocopies of work papers proving his employment, with the instruction to burn them when I was convinced, which I did gladly. Hammer worked around the Disney World Park during demolition and construction. At one point, he approached a superior regarding some strange construction plans. There were wide rectangular areas marked off on the blueprint above the site of a supermarket. The area was left unnamed and only bore the words, do not dig. Not only was his superior in the dark, but he was super fucking purposefully in the dark. He didn't want to talk about it, didn't want to know about it, and ended the conversation with, this space intentionally left blank. Hammer didn't get it. The area seemed a waste of space, and it was directly conflicting with the work his team had been given. He started poking around the area on his off time, finding only a derelict steel door and a great span of concrete just beyond. It was a supermarket's worth of blank gray floor. Soon after, Hammer started picking Gascots out of the crowds. Unlike all other reports, the people, the things, would stand in full view of the guy. They'd cluster together in the distance, or they'd just be pressed against a wall when he turned a corner. He said they moved weird, like they were weak or injured, like a deer that's been run down by a hunter and can't flee anymore. The gas masks, the Disney characters' faces with filters jammed in, he noted that they seemed wet on the inside, like condensation on a car window. Tiny beads of water glimmered behind the glass, making it impossible for any of them to actually see. Probing further, Hammer started asking questions of anyone and everyone who had been working in the park for a decade or more. He hit dead ends throughout, until he was directed to Ida an elderly woman who worked in a restaurant on Main Street. She's been there since way back, and though nobody had the balls to ask directly, everyone knew she had plenty of terrible stories to tell. Hammer asked about the empty space, then about the gas mask customers, and at first she thought he would receive the same non-answers he'd gotten so far. She was quiet, eerily quiet. Room zero, she croaked, a single shaky hand placed to her cheek as if she were a little girl fearing a father's punishment. She didn't meet the man's gaze for the entire conversation. Room zero, as it turned out, was yet another hidden room just like the apartments and Club 22. However, its sheer size and its spot deep beneath the park set it apart from any of the fun dark zones. It was a bomb shelter. Room Zero was built to withstand a massive attack, be it conducted by foreign or domestic enemies. Room Zero was to be stocked with enough rations to feed the entire park's average number of patrons at any given moment and housed a smaller yet lavish panic room of sorts for Disney higher-ups. During World War II, official Disney gas masks were actually produced for children to wear in the event of an attack. The idea was that it would be less scary for the children if Mickey's face was emblazoned on the wartime safety device. Yes, I know the obvious problems with that. During the Cold War scare of the 60s, when Disney World was constructed, Room Zero was stocked with similar masks as well. Whether they cared about the fears of children or just callous branding, the things found their way down there. What's more, some genius decided that kids would then be frightened by the gas masks their parents wore. And so all masks, adult and child, were made to comply to this insane standard. Ida described it as treating a wound with lemon juice. None of this explained what Hammer had been seeing, though. 
Not only the seemingly supernatural appearances, but the emptied out room as well. I've been in there, he explained. There's nothing but a cement floor and four walls. No. Ida shook her head and covered her mouth, stifling a sob. You've been on top of it. Someone or something sounded the alarm one day when the park was at full capacity. The warning was clear. It was supposedly an air attack. Security ushered everyone down, down, down in the tremendous shelter. There, they all were ordered to put on their masks and hunkered down for the duration of the assault. Everything was quiet for about 30 minutes, save for the crying children and the frightened whispers. No one wanted to die, and so they were thankful in a way for this strange measure of safety. Then the first scream rang out. Hey, a guy shouted, quit pinching. Waves of shrieks and yelps rippled through the crowd from one wall to the other, back and forth. Who's running around? Settle down, someone hollered. Who's laughing? This isn't funny. Ow! Who stepped on my foot? Despite security guards' urge to calm down and keep their cool, the crowd became more and more agitated until, well, finally... After nearly an hour of madness, the lights flickered, then died. What followed could only be described as utter chaos. In the dark, only the wails of the young and the anguished cries of adults could be heard in a massive, swelling din that bloodied the ears of all within that black echo chamber. A group of staff members and a select few patrons made it out of the door, ready to face the war above, rather than the insanity below. What they found, of course, was the desolate yet untouched theme park. The music continued to play, echoing through silent storybook towns. Upon returning to Room Zero, the few who stood at the top of the still staircase that led down into the pitch blackness heard no sign of the previous fray. There was only silence. Ida herself descended that staircase despite the begging of those she left above. She reached the reinforced doors, herself now awash in darkness and hearing only the buzzing in her ears. A single voice came out of the darkness. The echo made it impossible to tell whether the mocking, raspy voice was at the back of the bomb shelter or if it was right in front of her face. Shut the door, dear. You're letting out the cold. Gripped by terror, she did just that. Within days, the entire thing, shelter, staircase, all of it, was covered with feet upon feet of cement. Air systems and generators above its ceilings were removed, creating the large, empty space. They're all still down there, Ida told Hammer. Down there with whoever that was. You might notice I've used Ida's name. Unfortunately, she passed away soon after telling her story. Accidental fall, supposedly, after getting out of her bed to turn on the light. Such a company devotee, the paper reported, that her entire bedroom was covered with Mickey silhouettes. Hello everyone, I am from the UK and know that this may be a bit out of place, but I feel like there are some similarities to my stories that others might get a kick out of. Full disclosure, I'm not a psychologist and a researcher. I am firmly agnostic on the notion of anything possibly supernatural existing. But when pressed for what I believe, I am resolutely atheistic. Could something be out there? I don't know. 
Do I believe something is out there? Given the evidence presented, I think there isn't. However, being a good scientist means being honest about the experiences that don't fit within your rubric. I have psychological explanations for the following story, but they always feel incomplete. This takes place in 1990 and 1991. I was lucky enough to have grown up at a time when people could think about buying a house in central London without having to be oligarchs or oil aristocracy. It was a two-floor Victorian flat with a large garden just around the corner from the Natural History Museum, which is truly amazing when I look back on it. I was about six years old, and my father was increasingly traveling for work at this point, but that was nothing out of the ordinary. It was the middle of the day. My grandmother, mother, and older sister were downstairs in the kitchen or dining room, which led to the garden. I don't know what spurred me on, but I went up the spiral staircase, running, as part of some game where I was enthusiastic and going full pelt. I remember feeling happy and breathlessly excited, and the sudden jarring emotional turn. I remember I had stopped dead in my tracks with a deep feeling of fear. Like every fiber of my being was screaming that there was danger and something was just off. Even writing this right now, I can invoke that feeling and my hair stands on end. I don't like recalling the memory and tell the story, very rarely. At the top of the stairs, there was a landing between the living room and my parents' room. My parents' room has a wall of mirrors that contains closets. Standing in front of the old small TV, adjusting his bow tie, was my dad. My dad, who absolutely couldn't be there, turns to me and gestures me over with one hand, while smiling at me. I was being called into the room with a familiar smile and friendly gesture. At this point, my frozen apprehension broke taken over by sheer terror, and I bolted down the stairs as fast as I could. I had always been hesitant about running down those stairs as fast as I could climb them, as I had previously toppled down and knocked out my front tooth. When I was younger, of course. No such hesitation now. No such hesitation. I threw myself down and immediately sought out my very Irish grandmother, who wore these long flowing dresses and clung onto the dress for dear life. I could tell she was a bit surprised. At the time, I didn't know how to express what I was feeling or what had happened. I just clung on for a while. My granny could tell that something was wrong, but didn't press me for answers which was an odd response given her character and how I was behaving. It would be a very long time before I could convey this story to anyone. At the time, I just felt I needed to be right on her side to be safe. I don't recall if I ever told her, which I feel a little sad about upon reflection as our relationship didn't end well and she passed away a few years ago. That image of the father thing calling me over still bothers me, which is frustrating as on its surface, the experience of seeing my father prepare to head out to work while I sit on the bed behind him is usually one that only brings a happy sense of nostalgia. On a side note, I was raised Catholic, but we really didn't take it too seriously. We grew up with some stories of the fae folk and folklore of Ireland, but again, nothing ever given a tremendous amount of weight. My grandmother dearly disliked religion and called herself an atheist, but was often referred to as a witch, partly as a joke because she could be very well domineering, but also because there was a belief amongst my family members that she had a habit of predicting the future and having a sixth sense about things. 
I don't believe any of that myself, but thought a few of you may value that detail. This happened less than a month ago. I'm a petite female in her 20s. I'm currently living in Mexico to escape life a little after postgrad in a city that is not known as a dangerous place. A lot of foreigners live here, but I haven't heard any safety concerns. I'm living with my cousin who works 8 a.m. to 7 p.m. The houses are all in a pretty good area with a school, a nice hotel, and a Starbucks within walking distance, just to give you an idea of how unexpected this was. This incident happened while my aunt was visiting us from Mexico City. She stayed home all day with me while I usually study or watch Netflix. On this day, I was planning on having a chilled out day since I hadn't woken up until around 11.30 a.m. I'm watching something on my computer when I start to hear some loud pounding like someone was working on something with a hammer. This was at noon. I thought my aunt had let someone in to repair something. I was under the assumption my aunt was still in the house, so I wasn't too worried and continued to watch my show. The hard noises stopped, and I heard two male voices casually talking. This made me feel more confident that they were the ones here fixing something. I get up from my bed to fetch my phone. I don't have any service plan down here. To message my aunt on Facebook to see what was going on. I didn't get a reply from her, so I just took it as she was busy. I go back to laying in bed not thinking anything of the noises. Five minutes later, I hear footsteps coming up the stairs. Take in mind I'm laying in bed with my back to the door when the door opens and I see a man. He was a pretty normal looking guy with facial hair and was dressed rather cleanly. Like if you saw him in public, you wouldn't think anything negative about him. As soon as he saw me, he shut the door and went downstairs. Then I heard another huge noise that I later realized was him slamming the front door shut. My room is the first room directly above the stairs. So my first thought was this repairman accidentally popped my door open. I thought he was trying to get access to our patio. I was a little confused, but again, didn't think anything of the situation. I slowly walked down the stairs calling my aunt's name, but I get no response. As soon as I make it down the stairs, I hear my aunt in a panicked voice saying, They, they just robbed us. They took the TV. She forgot to lock the first iron door of the house, which made it easy for them to break open the second door. She said that when she was walking by from the store, she noticed someone by the house. She asked him what he wanted and said he was looking for a teacher. Then he got into a car with the other man and they left. She didn't notice the TV in their car or anything suspicious until she got into the house. She mentioned that someone had rang the doorbell before she left to the store when she went to check. No one was there. She believes they'd been watching her and my cousin. So when they opened my bedroom door, they were caught off guard and dipped. It's just really frightening to think about what could have happened if they didn't get scared off by seeing me. The cops came and were telling me that they often kidnap girls or rape them. I know, I got lucky. It was a night like any other on the desolate highways that crisscross through the heart of nowhere. My name's Jake and I'm a truck driver. Been hauling cargo through the lonesome roads for over a decade. 
the kind of life that keeps you company with the hum of the engine and the endless stretch of asphalt. That night, I found myself on a particularly eerie stretch of road, swallowed by an impenetrable fog, the kind that wraps around you like a suffocating shroud concealing the world behind. The only companions were the dim glow of my headlights cutting through the mist and the rhythmic beat of raindrops on the roof of my rig. I've heard rumors on the CB radio about this stretch, a place where truckers whispered of abandoned cars, tales of drivers gone missing without a trace. It was enough to send shivers down the spine of even the most seasoned drivers, but I'd always scoffed at such stories. That is, until that night. As I maneuvered through the winding road, the fog became denser, almost palpable. Visibility dropped to a few feet ahead, and the low hum of the engine seemed swallowed up by an oppressive silence. The glow of the headlights refracted off the mist, casting eerie shadows that danced like wraiths in the night. It was then that I saw him, a silhouette on the top of the road, a man or so it seemed, standing motionless in the fog. My instincts told me to keep going, but the human in me wanted to lend a helping hand. I eased off the gas, and the truck rolled to a stop beside him. He was oddly pale, and the fog clung to his form like a ghostly cloak. But what sent a shiver down my spine were his eyes. Big, round, and as black as the void itself. His mouth, a gaping maw, stretched wide in a manner that defied the laws of anatomy. I hesitated, a chill crawling up my spine. Something was terribly wrong. The man-creature didn't move, didn't acknowledge my presence. He just stood there, staring into the fog. With a lump in my throat, I decided to get going. But as I revved up the engine, I glanced back at him. That's when I saw it. The twisted, grotesque smile that curled on his featureless face. Panic surged through me, and I slammed my foot on the gas pedal, leaving the fog-draped figure behind. As I drove away, I grabbed the radio mic to share my unsettling encounter with fellow truckers. To my dismay, the once buzzing airwaves were silent. No static, no voices. Just an unsettling void that mirrored the fog outside. The road seemed endless, and I pushed the accelerator harder, the engine roaring in protest. I needed distance from that creature needed the safety of the city lights. But as the miles blurred together, the fog persisted, unyielding. I drove way over a hundred miles and was sure that creature was far away and I will never meet it again. In the distance, a lonely parking lot emerged and I decided it was time to pull over. The Weariness and fear clawed at me, and I desperately needed a moment to collect myself. I shut off the engine, closed the curtains, and tried to shake off the encounter as mere imagination. Little did I know that that night had only just begun, and the horrors lurking in the fog were far from done with me. I tried to convince myself that it was just fatigue playing tricks on my mind, I locked the doors, closed the curtains, and nestled into my bunk, hoping that the haunting image of that pale figure with the unnaturally large eyes and twisted smile would fade away with the night. But sleep remained elusive. After what felt like hours of tossing and turning, a sense of impending doom washed over me, jolting me awake. A shiver ran down my spine as I fumbled to open the curtains. The parking lot was bathed in an eerie glow from the flickering overhead lamps, casting long shadows that seemed to dance in the fog. That's when I saw them again, 
three of those nightmarish creatures. They stood like centennials, their dark eyes fixed on my truck. Panic gripped me as I fumbled to turn on the cab lights, revealing their ghastly features in all their horrifying glory. Their mouths, wide open, entitled guttural growls that reverberated throughout the metal walls of the truck. The air in the cabin grew thick with an otherworldly presence, a malevolence that seeped through every pore of my being. I reached for the ignition, praying that the truck would roar to life and carry me far away from this nightmare. But nothing happened. The engine remained silent as if in protest against the encrouching terror. The creatures, sensing my vulnerability, began to advance. Their movements were unsettingly smooth, almost as if they were gliding across the asphalt. The growls intensified, echoing through the desolate parking lot. I could feel the cold sweat trickling down my back as desperation set in. My hands trembled as I repeatedly turned the key, willing the engine to respond. The growls escalated into a cacophony and the creatures closed in, their features contorted in a grotesque display of hunger. Just as the creatures were about to reach the truck, a surge of relief washed over me as the engine roared to life. I slammed the gear into drive. The truck jolting forward, leaving the creatures behind in the rearview mirror. As the truck sped away, I couldn't shake the feeling that the creatures were not bound by the laws of this physical world. Their terrifying growls echoed in the distance, even as the city lights finally emerged on the horizon. I dared to glance back, and to my horror, I saw the creatures running after the truck with unnatural speed far beyond anything human. It was as if the shadows themselves were chasing me. As I drove into the welcoming glow of city lights, the creatures abruptly halted. Their twisted forms lingered at the edge of the urban sprawl, their growls fading into the night. Relief mingled with a lingering dread as I realized that they had a boundary a limit to their reach. I parked the truck in a well-lit area, surrounded by the comforting hum of civilization. My hands trembled as I reached the radio mic once more, hoping to connect with someone, anyone, but the static-filled airwaves remained stubbornly silent. The city light seemed to push back the darkness, but I couldn't shake the feeling that those creatures were still out there, waiting in the shadows for their next opportunity to strike. The night was far from over, and the road ahead held more horrors than I could fathom. I spent the restless hours of the night parked in that well-lit haven, the city lights warding off the encroaching darkness. but. No matter how brightly the urban landscape glowed, the images of those nightmarish creatures lingered in the recesses of my mind, their growls echoing like a sinister melody. As dawn began to break, I couldn't shake the feeling that the nightmare was far from over. I pulled back onto the road, my eyes scanning every shadow, every patch of fog with a newfound paranoia. The city lights gradually faded into the rearview mirror as the road stretched into another desolate expanse. My radio crackled to life. The sudden sound made me jump. It was the voice. A fellow trucker. Hey, you there. You okay? The voice sounded concerned and I eagerly responded, recounting the horrors of the night. The fog shrouded figures, the broken radio, and the unrelenting pursuit. There was a pause on the other end, and then the voice spoke, heavy with a mix of fear and disbelief. You are not alone. We've all heard these stories. The abandoned cars, the creatures in the fog. But we always thought they were just stories. The revelations sent a chill down my spine. 
I wasn't the only one who had faced those monstrous entities. The radio buzzed with hushed conversations among truckers, each sharing their own encounters with the supernatural on this stretch of road. The stories varied, but a common thread emerged. Those creatures, with their haunting eyes and twisted smiles, were a malevolent force that seemed drawn to the lonely roads in the dead of night. No one knew of their origin or their purpose, but they left a trail of fear in their wake. As I continued my journey, the unease persisted. The road seemed to stretch endlessly, and the fog clung to the edges of the highway like a malevolent specter. I couldn't shake the feeling that those creatures were watching, waiting for the opportune moment to strike again. The radio chatter intensified, with truckers exchanging advice on how to avoid the creatures, sharing tales of those who had disappeared without a trace. The fear was palpable, a shared experience that bound us together in the force of the unknown. With each passing mile, the city lights became a distant memory. The road ahead was swallowed by an impenetrable fog, and the radio once again fell silent. The hairs on the back of my neck stood at end, and a cold sweat broke out across my forehead. As I approached the familiar stretch where I first encountered the creatures, a sense of dread settled over me. The fog thickened, and the atmosphere grew heavy with the weight of unseen eyes. Then, a haunting realization struck me. This road was a loop, an unending circuit that brought travelers back to the heart of the supernatural. The city lights, the camaraderie on the radio, all illusions meant to deceive. The creatures weren't bound by distance. They were bound by time, forever hunting those who dare traverse this cursed stretch. A guttural growl echoed through the fog, and the twisted figures emerged once again. Their black eyes bore into my soul, their gaping mouths emitting an otherworldly well. I slammed my foot on the gas pedal, the engine roaring in protest, but the truck seemed tethered to the nightmarish loop. As the creatures closed in, the fog swallowed everything, and the road became an unending void. The last thing I saw were those eyes, an abyss that seemed to consume all light. The radio crackled to life one final time, a chorus of terrified voices screaming a warning. But it was too late. The creatures closed in, and the world descended into darkness. And so, the haunted highway claimed another victim, lost to the inter oops, lost to the eternal night and the malevolent creatures that lurked within the fog. The loop continued, a never-ending cycle of horror, trapping the unwary in an unending nightmare. The road stretched on, shrouded in fog, a haunted path that few dread to a haunted path that few dreaded to traverse and even fewer escaped this story is about my dad's ex-girlfriend my dad has horrible luck with women he is like a crazy magnet Every woman he has ever dated, except his current girlfriend, has been abusive both mentally and physically. This list includes my mother, but this story is about his last girlfriend, Mary. She has gone from stalking not only him, but me, my husband, and our daughter, too. They met at a Christmas party and hit it off. He had just gotten out of another bad relationship with a different woman that he had been on and off with for three years. She was the classic narcissist type. Well, Mary seemed different. She claimed she had also just gotten out of an abusive relationship herself. They went out for a few months, but she never let dad over to her place. 
He didn't find it at all that weird until he received a call from a man who said Mary was his wife and wanted to know how my dad knew her. At first, dad thought the guy was her ex, still trying to control her. But things started to add up. He finally confronted Mary, and she gave him some sob story about how her ex was refusing to sign the papers, but they were, in fact, separated. Dad did a bit of digging and even talked to Mary's parents at one point. He found out that not only was Mary definitely still married, but she wasn't even separated from her husband. As far as everyone in her life knew, she was happily married and my dad was just a friend, if they knew about him at all. Needless to say, he broke up with her. She lost it, started showing up at his work, calling in the middle of the night, texting him 50 times a day, all that good stuff. My dad miffed states twice and changed his number several times to try and get away from her, but she always found him. Love letters would arrive in the mail, or she would call and say she was coming to see him. Then she found my phone number. Probably sometime after my dad moved in with me, she started texting me almost as much as him. Once I married my husband and had my daughter, she really went all out, sending me presents for her new granddaughter, always wanting updates and the like. I never replied and either sent back unopened packages or donated the items she had sent directly to me from shops. Everything finally came to a head when she arrived on my dad's doorstep, like he was at work with a casserole for him. She gave it to his roommate and told him it was because she noticed my dad was losing weight. He told his roommate to toss it. He didn't want to risk poison since he had just applied for a restraining order. That same night, she showed up at my apartment while my husband worked the overnight shift. It was after 1 a.m. when she started knocking on my door. I was glad that I had sent my toddler to my aunt and uncle's for the night because I saw it was her. She left banana bread on my doorstep that we threw out as soon as my husband got home. The next night, I again left my toddler with my aunt and uncle in case she came back. She did. I started getting texts from her as she pounded on my front door. She wanted to see her grandbaby and have some girl time with me, then slowly devolved into demands for me to open up the door. I called the cops. While I was on the phone with dispatch, my neighbor came out ready to take her on. He told her cops were on the way since his wife was already calling them. She disappeared pretty quick into the park across the street. The cops couldn't catch her, but my dad's restraining order did get granted. We have since moved across the state, but she still texts me from time to time, wanting to know how my dad is or what my daughter is up to. I never answer, but I do save all of her texts just in case I have to get my own restraining order as well. This happened when I was 15, near Algonquin Park. My father and I were driving up to our cottage in the middle of winter. I always was so amazed at the beauty of Algonquin Park and Muskoka and had grown up enjoying the beauty of it every summer. Our cottage was on a large lake about a 30 minute drive from the nearest town. There were probably thousands of cottages on the lake. During the summer, the lake and the town's population tripled. It was cottage country, so people would spend all summer enjoying the lake and warm nights around campfires with family and friends. I spent every summer there growing up, and it still brings fond memories of sunshine and laughter and the sound of motorboats on the lake. But the winters were different. The people that didn't live there all year would venture back home to the city life, leaving the area mostly deserted, with 
cottage is boarded up for the winter. There were a few people that still frequently would come up every couple of months for a few days or so, but for the most part, the lake was silent during the winters, and the town was just filled with locals. The beautiful pine trees are always covered with snow, making the forest quiet. Our cottage was on a dead-end road. There were about 20 other cottages on that road, with ours being somewhat in the middle. The cottages were quite spaced out. However, with our closest neighbors being too far away to see through the trees. My dad had needed to head up to the cottage to do some painting that my mom had been bugging him to do. It was at the end of February, and it was a long weekend, so I tagged along so he wouldn't be alone, and we would spend some quality time together. It was about a five-hour drive from our home, but turned out to be an eight-hour drive due to the heavy snow. It had gotten dark out quite early, and it was around midnight as we drove through Algonquin Park. It was deadly quiet and pitch black except for the headlights of the car. We finally passed through the park, within only about 30 minutes left, to get to the cottage. It had stopped snowing and we were both eager to get there. As we turned onto the familiar road, I remember my dad cursing. It hadn't been plowed yet. This wasn't surprising, however. It probably wouldn't be until later the next day that we would even see a snowplow. As we drove down the road, I noticed that there were fresh tracks of tire tracks. The Smiths must be up for the weekend, my dad had said. All of a sudden, as we drove around the bend following the tire tracks, the headlights of the car shone on a white van that was parked on the side of the road. It was almost hidden by the vast trees that were covered with snow. What the... my dad mumbled. As we drove past the van, I remember looking back through the back window and very clearly seeing two figures in the front seat illuminated by our retreating taillights. I told my dad this, and he shrugged. Mm, maybe they're lost. I nodded, but couldn't help to think about how it was a dead-end road and why they would feel the need to park there. As we pulled into our driveway and we started bringing our stuff in, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was not right. I couldn't stop thinking about that van and why it was there with two people just sitting in the dark in the middle of the night. It spooked me so much that I begged my dad to let me sleep upstairs with him instead of sleeping downstairs in my room my sister and I usually shared. It had big windows with no blinds that looked out into the blackness of the forest, and my 15-year-old self was already scared of the dark, even without seeing the white van. It wasn't a big deal when my sister was there, but not tonight. As my dad got ready for bed, I sat in the living room reading a book. My dad had turned all the lights off, and I was just using a small lamp next to the couch to try and get through one last chapter before bed. It was so quiet, I could almost hear my ears ringing. I also started to get the feeling like I was being watched. The living room had large windows. Also, there were no curtains on them. That overlooked the lake, and it was black except for a light or two from cottages across the lake. I shut off the lamp and got up. Now that the cottage was dark, the moon was shining brightly, illuminating the snow. It truly was beautiful, and I walked towards the window to get a better look. Movement caught my eye, and I remember my heart dropping as I saw two figures down by the back porch, below the window, barely hidden by the surrounding trees. I dropped to the floor and crawled across the bedroom where my dad was sleeping. My heart was in my throat. I wasn't sure if they had seen me or not. I woke my dad up, and by the time he got to the window, the two figures were gone. Where I had seen the figures, Two sets of footprints in the snow led back around to the front of the cottage and back down the driveway. 
I begged my dad not to go outside. He double-checked the locks and turned on the porch light, hopefully to scare anyone off. My dad wasn't as freaked out as I was, but still set the alarm before he headed back to bed. I remember being very freaked out, and I lay there all night next to my dad, terrified. I'd look out the window and see someone staring back at me. The next morning, my dad went outside and confirmed that there were two sets of footprints leading from the road to behind the cottage and then back around to the front of the cottage and back down on the road. There were tire marks that showed the vehicle had turned around and then gone back up to the main road. My dad guessed that they were probably looking to break in and steal some stuff, as it was the middle of winter and not too many people were up at the lake. But they knew we were there. They would have seen our tire tracks leading to our cottage and my dad's car parked right out front. They also may have seen the lamp I had turned on to read and or seeing it go off. My dad didn't have an answer to that, and after much back and forth, he called the non-emergency line and reported it. Apparently, there had been some break-ins in the area, and some stuff had been stolen from some cottages that were boarded up for the winter. But again, and I still wonder to this day, why would they be interested in stealing from a house that clearly has people inside of it? So, about two years ago, my Nana brought home a Ouija board that she found at a yard sale. I have always been a true believer in the paranormal, and it's always been one of my peak interests. I have heard or read enough stories and watched enough shows to know not to mess around with a Ouija board, and quite frankly, they kind of freaked me out, so I wanted nothing to do with it. My Nana, on the other hand, doesn't believe in the paranormal whatsoever and thought it would just be a fun game for myself, my brother, and the oldest of my two cousins. I left it on the dining room table for days before she made me put it away. I ended up sliding it under my bed in hopes of just forgetting about it. My brother, 11, and my cousin, 12, bugged me about it constantly because they wanted to play with it and I wouldn't let them. I tried to explain to them it wasn't just a game and that it should not be messed with. But they were preteen boys who couldn't help but do things they shouldn't do. One day after I got home from work, the boys were there and I had the sneaking suspicion they played with the Ouija board. I looked under my bed and it was there, but I had this odd feeling about it. That's when I went downstairs and interrogated them about it. At first they denied it, but I saw right through them, and they finally admitted that they had played with it. I asked them if they had said goodbye when they were done, and they said they did. My cousin likes to over-exaggerate stories big time and make things up and be overly dramatic. So, when he told me a couple of things that supposedly happened, I didn't believe him at all. Also, they were boys who liked to mess with each other, so I assumed that's what was happening. Anyways, a couple of nights later, I got in bed, and as I lay there trying to fall asleep, I get this feeling that I am being watched. I look over at my closet, which has two sliding doors, and I notice one of the doors is slightly opened, leaving a small space between the doors. It creeped me out for some reason, so I turned and faced the other way, trying to ignore everything and just fall asleep. I finally fell asleep, and then next thing I know, I'm woken up by what felt like someone or something hitting me in the back of the head. I was laying on my back, so the back of my head was fully on my pillow, which made it even weirder. And it wasn't a light hit either. It freaked me out so much I was shaking. I looked around the room and I didn't see anything. 
But then, all of a sudden, I hear my floor creaking like someone is walking around my bed. I'm so freaked out at this point, it wasn't even funny. After laying there for a good little while, I finally got the courage to get up and grab my phone and book it to my living room. I sat down and tried to calm down. I could still feel a tingling, pulsating sensation on the back of my head. I turned on my phone and realized it's three in the morning. I called my boyfriend, who is now my husband, with tears streaming down my face from being so freaked out. He didn't pick up and I swear I called him another 15 to 20 times before I finally gave up. I sat in the chair until my Nana got up at around 6. I didn't tell her what happened because I knew she wouldn't believe me and would say I was just acting stupid. After she got up, I had breakfast and then called my boyfriend again. He finally picked up. He told me he had his phone on silent mode, so he didn't know I had been calling. I gave him so much crap for this, let me tell you. I told him what happened and he felt so bad and felt like an idiot for having his phone on silent. He told me he would have come over in a heartbeat to comfort me and was so apologetic. Later that day, he came over and... We took the Ouija board to a junkyard to get rid of it. My husband is the only one in my family that knows what happened, and I didn't experience anything again after I got rid of the Ouija board. Moral of the story? Ouija boards should not be messed with. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true scary stories. Before I go any further, I would like to acknowledge the elite members of Back to Ashes. Sugared Spike, Samantha Place, Colt Stonewolf, Stephanie McLaren, Tammy Slayton, Chrissy Elias, Tina Mead, Cindy, Amy Klimko, Anita V, Dova Khaleesi, Edith Smith, Luz Crispin, Patty's niece, Denise S, Call Me Carter, Corpse Lover, and Cindy Cleveland. Thank you all so much for remaining a huge supporter of Back to Ashes. For without you, there would not be a me, and there would definitely not be any vocal melatonin. Thank you. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed this compilation. In the meantime, please take care of yourselves and stay safe out there. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.